so yeah, I mean the um, so this talk is going to be primarily a kind of like theoretical, you know, in silico active inference kind of talk. Um, I'll try to sprinkle in some empirical data here and there, um, but um, but so yeah, my um, so you know one of my major interests is in um, more or less ways of understanding um, conscious and unconscious emotional processes in the context of emotional disorders. Um, and specifically, I've been really interested in seeing if you can find ways to um, you know, understand these sorts of processes um, at a computational level of description. Um, and so I'll tell you about one particular type of emotion cognition interaction that um, I've done a fair amount of work on um, and recently um, have tried to develop uh, deep active inference models of. Um, so, and the main, the main kind of goal with this, um, and this, the specific um, type of motion cognition interaction that I'll tell you about is um, it's, uh, related to an individual difference variable called trait emotional awareness. Um, and the idea is to use it as, as just an example of a, a sort of a relevant trait, dif trait psychological difference that's sort of clinically relevant, um, where the idea is, is that um, hopefully, even though you have this sort of single phenotype, of low emotional awareness as, a, as just something clinically relevant. Um, that doesn't mean that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between that phenotype um, and the underlying mechanisms that are causing it. Um, so the hope is to use both neuroimaging measures and computational modeling to sort of figure out, okay, what are all the different possible mechanisms that could be causing this? Can we use that to figure out ways to identify which mechanisms are operating in which people? Um, and then use that to inform treatment selection um, on an individual basis and potentially the treatment development. Um, so that's, that's the kind of general aim I have with using emotional awareness as, a, as an example. Um, so first, I'll kind of give you some background context. What is trait emotional awareness? A um, little bit about its clinical relevance. Um, I'll then give you a crash course on um, what we've called the, the three process model of emotion episodes. This is a very kind of, kind of like broad um, way of dividing up different processes that contribute what happens when you have an emotional experience um, that we've more or less come up with um, as a way to kind of tease apart what the different places are in that process of having an emotional experience, um, where things can kind of be different between different people um, that could explain differences um, in what happens in your body, what happens when you feel what happened in your body, um, how you interpret it, um, how you use that to make decisions, things like that. Um, and then I'll tell you about um, the kind of active inference version of this that I put together um, at UCL um, and then since, um, and um, what, if anything, uh, that might have to add in terms of understanding uh, possible mechanisms. Yeah. Okay, so first thing, emotional awareness. Um, the idea is that, so some people, it's just kind of this common clinical observation that some people understand their emotions or have trouble, they, um, some people have a lot more trouble recognizing and understanding their emotions than other people do. Um, at, a, at a low level, this can lead to things like mistaking negative emotions for signs of sickness. This is the kind of thing like somatization or somatoform disorders. Um, some people kind of divide up emotion space in a really coarse-grained way. Like they just kind of feel bad or good. But yeah, that's about it. Um, which isn't all that action guiding, right? If I know I'm sad, I have a much better sense of what the possible causes, what the likely causes are, what I ought to do to regulate my emotions, etc. So bad versus good isn't all that informative or action guiding. Um, it also, for the same reason, can lead to poor interpersonal problem solving. You know, if I'm not good at recognizing my own emotions, probably also not good at understanding other people's, right? Um, so there's a lot of ways that this kind of plausibly has an influence um, socially and in terms of emotion regulation for yourself. And um, so unsurprisingly, almost all psychotherapeutic approaches aim to improve emotional awareness in one way or another. Um, um, so the main sort of instrument that we've used to measure emotional awareness is um, something called the Levels of Emotional Awareness Scale. Um, it's technically performance-based, so it's based on self-report, but it's performance-based in the sense that it's not based on what you believe um, in your self-report. Um, basically what it does is it just asks you to describe how you'd feel in like 20 different hypothetical situations. And then it just takes the sorts of terms you use and then just scores them based on their kind of level of specificity more or less. So like if you say you're, you'd feel sick, that'd be like one point, it's like a fully somatic kind of thing. If you just say bad or good, that'd be two points. If you use a single emotion word like sadness or anger, that'd be three points. And if you can talk about, say, feeling multiple things at once, then it'd be four. Um, so that's the main way um, that people sort of 
objectively or performance based, kind of get a sense of what cognitive, the way, way, what sort of concepts do you actually use to understand your experience spontaneously when you're thinking about it. Um, and there's a, a pretty sort of large literature on this nowadays, so lower LEAS scores have been found in uh, quite a large number of different emotional disorders, as well as um, just systemic medical disorders. Um, and um, it's even things like essential hypertension or irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and higher LAS scores are associated with greater empathy, emotion recognition, openness to experience, lower impulsivity. So lots of things like this. Um, and it's because of that reason in part, it is part of the, uh, the RDOC matrix. Um, so largely by just way of motivating its importance. Um, so then, I mean, the idea is, like I mentioned before, um, it would be helpful if you want to know what the cause of this is in different people um, to have some understanding of what the underlying cognitive and neural processes are, and um, really the only way, so our attempt to try to do that was to uh, use this kind of broad three process model thing that I'll tell you about. Um, so I can't really go through all of the kind of supportive evidence to, to back everything I'm going to say up. <laughs> so, um, but we've, we've published a, a number of, a series of reviews kind of covering this and updating it in various ways. Um, but, um, oh, I'm sad. I was going to show you a fun video. Um, imagine that you were watching a car really serenely going down the road, and then like a zombie jumping up in the screen and screaming at you. <laughs> you should have all jumped. Um, <laughs> at which point, I would have said, OK, what just happened? Right. And I would have used that to guide you through the, uh, the three process model of an emotion episode, so you missed out. Um, but <laughs> so this is in the kind of boxology uh, depiction what the uh, three process model is. So more or less, you start out with some sort of event. It could be real, it could be remembered, it can be imagined, but you're representing some event, right, in some way. And then once it's represented, then you um, both implicitly and explicitly evaluate it along a bunch of different dimensions. Um, this can be really low level, like condition response kind of thing, but it can also be higher level, like, you know, is this something controllable? Is this congruent with my goals? Um, you know, things like, things like that. Um, and so that is what we call the initiator um, of affective response <coughs> generation processes. And the idea here is based on that evaluation, you have some kind of allostatic prediction, right, about what sorts of cognitive and metabolic resources you're going to have to bring to the table in order to deal with it um, and bring yourself sort of back to preferred states. Um, and that response broadly, again, has two different kind of components to it. It has a cognitive component, or a central component, and then a um, peripheral physiological component. So the, um, the cognitive component is going to be things like initiating attention biases, interpretation biases, um, motivations to, say, approach avoid, things like that. Whereas the involuntary bodily response, the peripheral component, is going to be things like automatic changes in facial expression, automatic changes in heart rate, muscle tension, things like that. Um, and so once that all kind of gets going, and I should say this is all kind of going at every moment, so it's all feeding back and influencing itself as well. But then you kind of have some update in your model about what it is that just happened, right? What, what, what just changed in my body? Um, and how do I interpret it? So, um, and I'll go into more detail on that, but this would be where you'd say, okay, I, I feel an increase in heart rate. I interpret that as indicating that I'm afraid, right? Something like that. Um, and then finally, um, it's important to, to realize that um, at least briefly, there's evidence to suggest that all of these things can be briefly represented unconsciously without you being aware of it. So there is this sort of further process that you need where these representations are, say, are selected and sort of maintained active in some way. So you can kind of hold them in working memory and use them to make some sort of deliberative decision. Um, so we've just called that conscious access working memory, you know, access to working memory, something like that. Um, so, you know, as a fear example, had you seen the jump scare, you know, it would have been like event, scream, zombie, you know, the evaluation, unexpected potential danger, you know, some low level association between loud scream and danger, and then you would have had some change in your body that you could sort of represent that way. This is actually data based on, you know, I've had a bunch of people kind of draw how they feel on their body when they say they're feeling different emotions, and they, there are these kind of like interesting, reliable perceived patterns. Um, so you have something like that. I'm going to have the initiation of some kind of threat bias and some avoidance motivation. 
you know, you'd feedback and you'd represent those bodily sensations. You'd identify that as corresponding to your learned concept of fear. And then if that all gets accessible, you'd be able to say, I just got scared because of the abrupt, unexpected jump scare. Right, so that's kind of, so process one, generate the affective response. Process two, represent it in this kind of hierarchical way. And process three, gain access to it, hold in working memory, use it. And I can, I can do this for other things, right? So it could be you got denied a promotion, that was goal incongruent, and you direct the blame at other people, say your boss, right? You have this anger, kind of like bodily feeling, right? Ugh, fists, really active. Negativity bias, but an approach motivation, right? You represent the ugh, and that you think you're angry, and then that becomes accessible and you can say, I'm really angry at my boss because he didn't give me the promotion, I deserved it, right? So hopefully that gives you guys kind of the intuition. Um, and if you kind of zoom in on this uh, internal state representation part, that's going to be a big chunk of the modeling. Um, then you can kind of think about it as, again, at the kind of low level, you, you have this feedback from your body and you're representing something like a valenced, valenced interoceptive representation, um, along with some somatomotor stuff like facial expression changes, things like that. But then you kind of have to map that in some way up to some higher level interpretation um, that's going to depend on what you've learned, right? Like emotion concepts, for example, are different in different cultures. So it's not like there's one kind of true answer about what of the bajillion different multidimensional body states you could be in and some particular emotion concept, but you make sense of it in some way, you know, that you've learned. And there can be differences in the granularity or specificity or action guidingness, right, of the ways you've come to carve it up. Um, so this could again be, you feel a body feeling like that, you map it onto sadness with priors that come from the cognitive part like unexpectedness, loss, uncontrollable, etc. Um, and this is actually meant to be like fully sort of general and analogous to say like a visual case where you see say a visual image like that, you'd map it onto the concept shovel, right, in the context of other aspects that you're representing, say like tools, shed, you know, familiar, controllable, etc. Um, and I should say that this is like a huge simplification, right? There's definitely not two levels of representation of body states. If you're interested in this, we published a paper a couple of years ago um, laying out um, based on a lot of kind of just nitty gritty about anatomical and physiological responses and or characterizations that you can kind of lay out a, uh, and even this is oversimplified eight level kind of hierarchy um, for how you represent interoceptive states and kind of integrate them with higher level information from other senses and memory. Um, but good enough for our purposes here. Um, and then the final process, um, so we've kind of based this largely on this work on um, what are called global workspace models of consciousness, or at least the um, empirical support for them, which broadly shows, again, that say if you play somebody a sound, but you, they don't hear it because it's, say, um, the intensity is too weak or they're distracted by something, you get this kind of local representation in auditory cortex, but only when it's detected does it have this kind of global broad influence on association cortices throughout the brain. So the idea is consciousness requires accessibility of the information carried by that local representation via this broad sort of causal influence. Um, it's updating a model more broadly, you could think about it that way. Um, so here the idea would be something like you could represent, you could have some representation of a body state like that. You could have primed a concept like sadness and you could have primed you know, things like unexpectedness, loss, et cetera. Um, but that may or may not you know, become broadly accessible. Um, if it is, then you could say things like, I'm sad because I just lost a friend and I don't have much energy right now. Um, but maybe only the body state um, becomes accessible. Mm -hmm. and then you'd be able to say, I feel really low energy, but I don't know why. You know, maybe I'm sick. Um, or you could have access even to the interpretation, but not to the underlying sort of causes. Mm -hmm. Right, and then you could say, and this happens fairly often, right? I feel really sad, but I'm not sure why. There's yes. a, in in real life, there's a kind of top-down process mm -hmm. in the sense that you're in a context, and there are norms and expectations mm -hmm. for what you might feel in that mm -hmm. context. So those schemas are sort of available as, right. as high-level priors. Yeah, and you could you could think about that as as priors coming in part from this kind of cognitive appraisal dimension sorts of things, but that could also act as priors on just what emotion concept you, you think best fits the bodily feeling 
so that could, that could probably come in in a couple places. I guess I'm thinking of it even as prior to having any bodily feeling and mm -hmm. as to priming that in some ways and maybe even increasing the likelihood of having certain bodily feelings mm -hmm. or of even selecting out a sort of white noise bodily feelings mm -hmm. the possibility of labeling something that doesn't have a strong valence attached to it but assimilating it into that expectation. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, there's questions about whether that's coming in at the response generation part or after, mm -hmm. right? I mean, either you're not generating the response to begin with, in which case you're not going to have a bodily feeling because the body didn't do anything, right? Or it could be the way you interpret it after the fact, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, it seems like this is where you can kind of disentangle a couple different things potentially. <coughs> yes? Short comment, but your model has just given a reason for doing a hyper scanning of spinal cords. So I don't think I fully understand. Nothing. I mean, nothing I've been talking about. I think is at the level low enough to be something like pain gating in the well, that's spinal cord. Interesting part. thing about it is we experience. It's how we experience pain is uh, is, will, is dependent very much on social context. Mm -hmm. um, uh, any any rugby player on the rugby field will tell you that. Mm -hmm. And where the gating occurs neuroanatomically seems to. Uh, um, so that can certainly happen via these sort of like descending, say, exactly. like, you know, like. So it would be, and it would be quite nice because also all the interoceptive mm -hmm. stuff for the gut goes in mm -hmm. through, uh, uh, well, some of it goes through the vagus, some of it goes through spinal. Sure. But it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a good case for doing a, a spinal yeah. cord uh, hyperscan. Yeah, I mean, there is, I mean, there is, there is a lot of work on pain representation actually within the like global workspace in a sort of approach to conscious processing. And um, there, I mean, depending on the reason or the actual, basically there are circumstances in which the pain representation probably gets a lot higher up, like into the insula, for example, but you still don't become so conscious of it anyway. Interpreted yeah. pain, but the, um, but, they, but they will, have, people will actually continue without physical, in, in, any kind of awareness. It's the, you get the sensation lower down, mm. then the insula and the uh, thalamus are really where the, But it doesn't have to be, but it wouldn't have to be conscious. It could, that, could, that representation can happen unconscious. I mean, we, we probably have to talk yeah, about yeah, it more but, later. But yeah. it, then you put the reason to go down yeah. the final um, But So anyway, so I mean, that's, that's kind of just a brief kind of crash course. And um, just, just to kind of frame a few of the kind of neuroimaging results that I'll kind of, you know, sprinkle in throughout the way. Um, I, um, we have kind of proposed, a, and based in part on some of our research, a kind of tentative um, kind of large scale model for the way to think about these processes in the brain, um, based mainly on work on um, uh, the function of large scale brain networks. Um, so the idea is, is that, I mean, you know, there's still kind of up in the air exactly the right way to interpret these things, but um, while you can't really say conditional on knowing that a particular brain area activated, um, you can't really know that much about psychological, what psychological function was going on. Looks like you can actually do this quite a bit better if you know what brain areas are talking to one another based on functional connectivity. Um, and so based on that um, kind of thing, you know, people have kind of looked at a number of studies and proposed, um, for instance, this paper by uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett and Ajay Sapate, um, ways of understanding kind of broad domain general functions of um, these different networks. And um, you know, one, for example, this thing the, in cream here, the limbic network, looks like it's pretty strongly involved in representing and regulating visceral motor states. Um, and so it's kind of a prime target for generating these sorts of affective bodily responses in response to evaluations. Um, whereas the uh, somatomotor network here and salient, salience network components, especially sort of insula and anterior cingulate, um, look like some of that is also involved in the generation process, but also looks like it's pretty important for representing interoceptive and somatosensory states. So there be a lot of the kind of body state representation stuff. Um, the default mode network, the scan cream here is um, pretty strongly implicated in a lot of conceptualization related processes, right? So multimodal integration, trying to make sense of things at a semantic level, um, launching these sort of large scale simulations um, over kind of like on long temporal scales based on um, drawing from long term memory, things like that. Um, and then the yellow thing, executive control network, largely implicated in things like working memory, executive function, cognitive control, and it's 
a big chunk of what activates during the uh, global global work stream, uh, conscious versus unconscious contrasts. Um, so the kind of thing we have in mind is, you know, you have some perceptual representation. It either gets interpreted, you know, via default mode network processes, or directly has some sort of conditioned association thing with limbic network um, processes. That ends up generating a change in body state and some modulatory effects on cognition, likely based on um, um, influencing these sort of broad neural modulatory patterns from brainstem neuromodulators. Um, that'd be kind of the you know tweaking precision here and there kind of a thing. Um, body state information then feeds back in and updates your model. Um, so representing your body in a different state now, that then can feed back and further get interpreted and conceptualized as an emotion or as something else um, via the same sort of default network processes. All that stuff can then compete for uh, maintenance and working memory, and then all of it can both consciously and unconsciously then influence action selection in some way, right? So again, very, very broad. Um, we do have some studies consistent with it, but I wouldn't say it's, you know, at all kind of, you know, take it to the bank. Um, it's just kind of something to guide hypotheses. Um, and so, you know, we thought, okay, well, you could have individual differences in the response generation stuff, in the representation stuff, or in accessibility. Um, and those could each, you could tweak each of those independently and produce a similar kind of phenotype, right? So different things could be going on in different people, and knowing what's going on in what person would be important, potentially, in terms of intervention. Um, would, would you, sorry, would, would you classify facial expression and display mm -hmm. as part of a response? Yes. I mean, that's what we're feeling. Yeah. Because right? there are big cultural differences in sort of training for the degree mm -hmm. to which you display things. And so yeah, absolutely. And there can be some kind of, you know, top-down control stuff too, yeah. right, where you could have the automatic tendency to do one thing but then suppress it given some norm, right? And um, so that also gets pretty complicated pretty fast. Yes. Um, very briefly, just to pick up on what you were saying earlier, on the course, very general level, without even getting into cultural differences, to get a sense of the general picture, it seems to me maybe we need to talk about top top down processes, mm -hmm. where cognitive framing is always culturally framed. Mm -hmm. So experiencing any emotion for humans uh, has something to do with the attribution of meaning, finding like a narratively postulated cause. And then say the strong interoceptive surprise will probably mm -hmm. top up, go back up to like say, you know, activate system two resources, then you go and Google for symptoms, mm -hmm. then you imagine a new cause and then that goes back down and affect how you feel. Yeah, absolutely. No, I yeah, I don't disagree at all. So I mean I really really important yeah. domains of statistical regularity because this is this cultural narrative. Oh absolutely. Which a pattern in. Yeah. And I mean I, you know, I'd like to pack some of that into, you know, the sort of you know, like the hierarchically expanded version of this like evaluative appraisal sort of thing I'm talking about, right, where you can definitely have a lot of these top-down influences, even when they're not culturally specific, right, like amygdala, the amygdala will respond pretty strongly to uh, images of food when someone's hungry but not when they're full, for example, right, so I mean this sort of top-down expectation about what's relevant, you know, in your situation can be very context-specific, right, so I mean there's definitely a lot of that, and a lot of the way that you evaluate things in terms of, say, consistency with norms and values, um, consistency with your current goals, mm -hmm. all of that is going to have very much a sort of top-down component and influence the response you have to whatever you think is going on. Um, but it will also influence other things too, right? Like the way you interpret what state you're in after the fact. So I, yeah, I just totally agree. Um, um, okay. So um, like I mentioned, we've done sort of a number of studies over the last few years um, testing various aspects of this and finding neuroimaging results, um, both structural and functional, that um, we at least think are consistent with it. Like I said, I'll mention some of them along the way. Um, but um, all of this is primarily to motivate why it's worth trying to do a fancy active inference model version. Um, so since we haven't um, really talked about active inference at all, at least not the markup decision process formulation, it could probably be worth giving people kind of a quick walkthrough. Um, you know, if you've seen this kind of BayesNet depiction before, it can be kind of intimidating, it's a billion variables. Yeah, it doesn't say, doesn't say anywhere what they mean. Um, so I'll try to give you kind of a kind of step-by-step -step here real briefly. So if you get rid of most of that, and you just have this O thing at the bottom, this connection up that we'll call A, and then this S thing, which is the state that you, the state you believe you're in, and then D, which is essentially your prior expectations about states, then this is just a pretty simple sort of depiction of 
kind of one-step Bayesian inference. You have some prior expectation, you get some observation, you infer what that observation means um, based in part on what you expected ahead of time, right? And the, uh, so D is your priors. The A matrix essentially just describes your beliefs about the relationships between states and observations, right? Like something white and circular is more consistent with baseball than football, right? I mean, that's basically all it, all it amounts to, right? So then if you're going to, um, to expand on that then, you know, we don't just observe things statically, right? So you need a temporal um, component to this, and that's where this B matrix thing comes in. So that's essentially your beliefs about how things, how states evolve over time. Um, so once you figure out what you believe about what you're in, about where you were or what state you were in at time one, this B matrix lets you, gives you a prior and okay, what state do I expect now to be in at time two? And so then that becomes your prior, you get an observation at the next time point, and then you infer a posterior over state at time two, um, which can then also feed back and update your beliefs about what happened at time one. Um, but, but essentially all you're doing is just making this thing temporally extended, so beliefs at one time point act as priors for the next time point. Um, but this is still fully perceptual. Um, so then to add an action model on top of it, um, you have to add these things. So pi here is just your set of allowable policies, so it's the choices you take yourself to have. Um, this G thing is the expected free energy of each policy, essentially co encodes your um, something like the estimated value you assign to each policy. Um, and that is evaluated with respect to the C vector thing, which encodes more or less what you want and what you don't want. So in active, in active inference lingo, it's your prior preference distribution. Um, and then finally, so okay, just to give you a sense, so G, the expected free energy, um, that is one way of displaying the equation. I won't go into it in detail, but um, the thing to understand more or less is it has a component that involves minimizing the deviation between the outcomes that you think are going to happen if you choose a certain policy and, the, and your preferred outcomes. See, so technically you're minimizing the public label divergence between the outcomes you think are going to happen and the outcomes you want given each choice you could make. Um, and then the second component um, involves a way of um, also basically policies end up having higher value if you think that them leading you to transition to certain states is going to be really informative. Mm -hmm. It's going to minimize uncertainty more about what states you're actually in. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So this uh, C shouldn't be part of the or like the observation? So because you like causally linked it to the expected free energy, but it's like prior over your so Yeah, so I mean, all, all you should take this to mean is just that the, the value of policies, so the, the posterior distribution over pi, is going to be based on the free energy calculated with respect, the expected free energy calculated with respect to C. Um, C being your preferences. C being, C being what you prefer, a yeah. yeah. priori, right. Um, so, so more or less, just this just means policies have higher values if they're going to get you closest to what you want, and if they're also going to give you more information about where you know what's actually the case, um, because a lot of times before you can know what you should do to get what you want, you have to know enough about you know what the state of affairs actually is. Um, so then finally, the last step um, is adding these additional things, um, which won't matter a ton for what I'll show you, but um, more or less these additional kind of hyperparameters allow you to allow the model to maintain estimates. Of it's essentially its own confidence in its action model itself. Mm -hmm. So um, this sort of beta gamma thing is more or less a way of having a prior and then updating um, this expected precision term, which more or less reflects your confidence in how good your action model is. Um, and that ends up actually trading off influence with um, this E thing, which is essentially a fixed form prior over policies. So it's sort of the policies you expect a priori to select over others. Mm -hmm. so you think we're kind of like a, just like habits, more or less. Um, and so the way this ends up working is, is that um, policy selection will be more driven by habits if gamma is low, if you have very little evidence or very little confidence in your action model. Mm -hmm. um, and having a prior, a prior for high beta is going to bias your initial gamma estimate toward being lower, which means you're going to favor um, acting based on habits. Um, so that's the way of interpreting this thing. 
Um, and I yes. I just have a question. How, how do you normalize the, the pragmatic versus uh, epistemic? Uh, um, so that so that will happen kind of just on its own. I mean, that both just falls out of the expected free energy equation, right? So. So you just have the epistemic component is that latter component, and the pragmatic component is the, the earlier part of the, side, the right side. So, so for instance, like it just it just will happen automatically that whatever value, whatever whichever policy has the lowest um, expected free energy, will will be a trade off between those those two. Would, would like, there's nothing weighting them outside of just okay. the equation. Because it, it would be possible to have like a, a kind of hyperparameter for certain people to have more one or the other values, right? So an empirical, so, in like, so if you want to like fit behavior empirically, yeah. you know, I tried to do this before where you can actually throw in an additional, throw in an additional term that will mm -hmm. essentially weight the epistemic component versus the pragmatic component. Mm -hmm. But in practice, what will happen is because the, uh, because the, um, the C vector, because the, the magnitude of the preferences can, can vary continuously, um, then just the higher the magnitude is, the, the greater the weight the pragmatic component will have. Mm -hmm. So having a low magnitude mm -hmm. C just automatically makes it so you're more driven by epistemic value. Yeah, and you could also, one more step would be uh, that we could add a precision, just like you have now for reaction model, but then add it to C. So maybe yes. if you're hungry, then mm -hmm. you start being more guided by your preferences for food. Mm -hmm. So you can like temporarily upregulate and like kind of prioritize the pragmatic over the epistemic. Mm -hmm. uh, but that would be an even more hard work. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, that's that's not built into the standard MDP formulation, but yes, I mean there's there's definitely fancier things you could do. Casper has tried to do some of them. Um, which I I don't know, are you gonna talk about that at some point? Uh, well yeah, maybe during the tutorial. Okay. Okay. Well, stay tuned then. Um, so so anyway, and just briefly, I mean you can't really see this all that well, but um, the uh, the active inference formulation I'm just showing you also has this kind of uh, proposed accompanying neural process theory mm -hmm. that allows you to um, essentially simulate um, plausible neural activation that you want to see given the dynamics in the model. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be that important for what I'll show you, but more or less, um, you just end up um, you end up being able to derive these update equations that um, just cast um, uh, the essentially the equations for updating free energy and for expected free energy in terms of these two different sorts of prediction errors called state prediction errors and outcome prediction errors. Mm -hmm. And then those then, those errors then feed into calculating or updating the free energy and expected free energy estimates. Um, and then you can just do, you just do gradient descent, gradient right. descent on those. Um, and what ends up happening is that belief updates from moment to moment correspond to changes in um, activation levels in different of these kind of simulated neurons. Whereas the, um, the actual matrix entries, like the, the matrix, matrix entries in A and B and C and D that, that indicate more your kind of like more stable beliefs about relationships mm -hmm. between things, those end up <coughs> corresponding to synaptic connection strengths, which you can learn, but you update them more slowly across trials. Mm -hmm. um, um, but like I said, it won't matter that much, but I'll show you. Um, so applying that then to understand emotional awareness um, is uh, um, something that we've not tried to do. Um, and one thing, uh, so you can just ignore this top part. Basically, all that, all that adding the second level on means is that you just tack the same thing on uh, atop what I just showed you. So, so the state, your state inference at the end of each trial at the lower level just ends up being the observation that feeds into the same exact structure at the level above. So for instance, you'd run the lower level like three times and then that would correspond to three observations over time by the higher level. Um, and so for the, the kind of task we put together to model emotional awareness um, is this kind of emotion-focused working memory task, more or less. So the idea is, is that the agent is presented with some kind of affective response at time one and has to infer what emotion it's feeling. And then some time goes by presented with another affective response has to infer what it's feeling now. And then there's this kind of delay period where it's going to hold on to that information and manipulate it, um, at, which, at which point it's exposed to a third affective response and it has to say, okay, is what I'm feeling now the same or different from some of the stuff I was feeling before? Um, so it's kind of a reflection on current versus past emotional experience. This is actually you know, a thing not too dissimilar from stuff that can happen in therapy, right? Um, and it's also, um, well, here, I'll get to this. So. 
But the, uh, so the idea ultimately with, with the model, as I'll show you, is you end up having these two nested tasks. So first, you have this affective response that kind of comes up from your body and you represent it, um, which can have you know, various dimensional components, valence, arousal, motivation, your kind of interpretation of a situation, things like that. And the first task is to infer which emotion concept that you currently have acquired best accounts for that pattern for level representations. But then at the second level, you have to take that and um, map it into working memory. And then you have to kind of do something with it in working memory to be able to self-report it and use it in deliberative cognition. So task one is just figure out what you're feeling at a given moment. And task two is kind of accumulate evidence for what different things you're feeling over time and then use them uh, to deliberate to make a choice. Um, and um, I should say this particular um, task um, is motivated by the fact that we've actually done um, some empirical work on emotion-focused working memory um, with just little tasks like this where you show people uh, emotional images and um, you either ask them to hold what emotion they felt in mind or just hold the visual image in mind or hold like their bodily sensations in mind or hold nothing in mind over some delay period. And then they have to make some you know, judgment afterwards about whatever they were holding in mind. Um, and what you can find is actually consistent with the three process model I showed you, you get um, in the emotion condition relative to just holding visual images in mind, you get a lot of this medial prefrontal um, and anterior insula kind of default mode network kind of stuff. Whereas in, um, in both conditions, actually emotion greater than rest and also envision greater than rest, you get this dorsolateral um, frontal parietal thing that you'd expect for any kind of working memory. Um, so. So it's kind of like the representation may be specific, but what's holding it in mind is general. Um, and um, this also follows on previous work showing that just when people pay attention to their emotions and just recognize them, you also get this default mode network activation. Um, but so okay, so so the first level in the model uh, formally, so it has this kind of structure where there are a bunch of different things that you can observe. You can observe different. Um, valences, different arousal levels, different approach or avoidance motivations, and three just general different kind of evaluated contexts that you could be in. It's called like a neutral context, a social threat context, or a physical threat context. And again, this is very just kind of toy model to get across the general structure. Um, but the idea is, is that what it is to have acquired different emotion concepts um, is to have learned particular mappings um, to different sorts of regularities that occur across those different lower level representations. Um, so for instance, and you can encode, you encode that in, for instance, the A matrix here. So this basically says that sadness um, corresponds to negative valence, low arousal, avoidance, and social threat, right? Whereas happy on the end corresponds to um, neutral, wait. I might, I might have that wrong. Uh, oh, no, sorry, that's heart attack. My bad. So it's sadness, <laughs> panic, sickness, and heart attack. <laughs> right, okay. I was like, happy, no, that's wrong. Yeah, so happy is negative, high arousal, avoid, and physical threat. Right, so I mean, that's, that's kind of what it looks like. So it's just encoded in those connections, more or less. And for this particular model, we're just assuming that within a trial, an emotion remains stable. Um, so the B matrix is an identity matrix. Um, and... Um, and then, you, know, you really can't see it down here, but um, down here, so it's, this is showing that, so the, the actual um, affective response generation component, right here would amount to uh, some sort of, sort of like visceral policy selection process, right? You'd interpret your situation a certain way, and you'd select, say, to like increase heart rate policy, right? Or something, something more high dimensional than that, obviously. But, um, and so we're not explicitly modeling that there, we're just assuming a particular response has been generated, um, that it's consistent with your evaluation of the context, and that you're just being, the agent's kind of being presented with the, the result of that, of that response. Um, and so, which I'm just highlighting here is that we're kind of assuming that's the case, but we're not actually modeling the response generation, that, that even lower level policy selection first. Um, and, uh, and then the second component of the first level is there is a kind of selective attention component built in. Um, and the idea here is to, to figure out what you're feeling 
you have to kind of selectively attend and say, okay, what valence am I feeling? Okay, you know, what does my body state feel like? Oh, what do I feel like? Do I feel like I, I should run away or, you know, approach? You know, what do I, what are my actual beliefs about the situation? Things like that. Um, this is actually the exact sort of thing that often people do in like cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, where you kind of track patterns, right? And like what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what you did, you know, stuff like that um, to try to increase people's awareness. Um, so it's meant to kind of mimic that process. Um, and so the idea is, is that the agent has to kind of choose what to pay attention to across the trial to infer what emotion um, makes the most, you know, best fits the experience. Um, and so you can kind of, the way that gets implemented is that the actual, uh, the actual probability distribution in the A matrix um, is, uh, becomes higher dimensional. Essentially, it's different conditional on what attentional state you're in. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the attend to valence state, then the A matrix looks like that. If it's attend to arousal, it looks like that. Mm -hmm. If it's attend to motivation, it looks like that. And if it's attend to context, it looks like that. Um, right, so that's, that's the way it ends up being structured. Um, so, so for the first level, then, you can use that all by itself without tacking on the second level at all to do this kind of single um, single emotion recognition process, right? The emotional state representation component of the tree process model. Um, and this is what it looks like when the model performs successfully. So here, um, the agent was presented with an affective response that was most consistent with sadness, according to the concept it had learned. Um, and so you can see what happened is it first chooses to pay attention to context, and then it chooses to pay attention to arousal. And then at that point, it says, okay, I'm confident based on the social threat context and low arousal that sadness is the right thing, and so it reports sadness. Um, and then you can just kind of see over here how the confidence kind of shifts slowly toward being confident, most confident in sadness by the third time point in the trial there on the right. And this stuff on the bottom is just kind of simulated, um, simulated like uh, event-related <laughs> potentials that you would see, but don't worry about that. Um, so then the, the second level then, um, the working memory component um, involves doing a sort of similar thing. So basically, what you have here is, is now, once the agent's inferred what emotion, say sad or panic, or what other bodily state, sick or heart attack, you know, however it's categorizing its state at a given time, um, those provide evidence over time for different things that could be held in working memory. So this could be just being sad, just feeling panic, feeling both sadness and panic, um, et cetera, et cetera, for different combinations. Um, and then you have another independent hidden state factor that corresponds to um, the comparison state. So essentially what you find out at the end, um, the third emotion that you're feeling, you have to judge whether it's the same or different than one of the original two. Um, and um, so the, the A matrix for that one just looks like that, um, which I can go into if you want, but it, it just describes that mapping I just described. Um, and then there are a couple additional hidden state factors you have to build in here. Like you have to build in um, beliefs about the task structure. So the agent has to know, for instance, that it's um, at time point one, you know, in the working memory task, time point two, whether it's in a delay period, um, et cetera. Um, and then it also has to choose to report um, at the end of the trial just two things, just same or different. You know, is, it, is, is what I'm feeling the same as before or not? Um, and that leads to observations where it gets some feedback, where either it was, you know, it gets it right or um, it gets it wrong. Um, and the C matrix here just basically says it wants to get it right and it doesn't want to get it wrong. Um, so this part would be modeling the kind of conscious access process more, where once you have these representations, you map them in and hold them in mind and you can do something with them. Um, and so a successful trial with the model here looks like this. Um, so, at, so at the first time point, so the, this middle panel here corresponds to the single state inference at the lower level. So first it, it infers nothing, so we just call that blank. The second time point it infers it was feeling sadness. At so the third time, panic. Then blank again, because it's the delay period. Then at the fourth time point, it thinks it felt neutral. And then uh, blank again. That's just the structure of the trial and what it, what it experienced at each moment. And you can see at the second level what happens is it slowly builds up confidence over time that the sadness plus panic state is the right one, <laughs> right? Um, and then it holds that information in mind over this delay period after it observes the second emotion 
and then uses that at the end to choose to say different, um, in which case it observes that it was correct. Um, How can you be sad and finished? What'd you say? How can you be sad and finished? Um, so I mean, the idea is that these are these are beliefs. These are, <laughs> so these are these are beliefs about how it how its feelings changed over time, right? Um, but well, I mean, so for instance, say say you had a panic. I mean, this is not uncommon. You have a panic attack, and then you're really sad the rest of the day that you had a panic attack, right? Um, happens. Um, so so the, the the potential usefulness of this kind of thing, other than just showing you know fancy simu flashy simulations is um, that you know, it allows you to kind of interrogate what are the different ways that things can go wrong? What are the different possible mechanisms by which things could break down? Okay, um, where you could have different potential intervention targets. Um, so the first one, and I'll just sort of mention this really briefly, is just you can, maybe you're just failing to generate responses at all. Um, in which case, just means visceral policies aren't being selected in the first place. Um, there's nothing to explicitly simulate there. But I mention it because it's probably not an unreasonable thing to think happens in some cases. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in one study we did, we actually did find <laughs> that um, the thinner visceral motor cortices were, um, the lower emotional awareness scores were. Um, so suggestive. Um, more interestingly, we've done some, uh, we've reported on these uh, case studies, of these extreme sort of rare cases where, um, for instance, this woman just reports she's never experienced an emotion in her whole life. Um, just flat, just emotionless experience. And she's really like paradoxically distressed by it because she ultimately committed suicide because she said her life felt meaningless without any emotion. Mm -hmm. um, and when we, did, like, when we did like skin conductance responses on her, totally flat. No responses to emotional images whatsoever. Um, but, but it was more just like they were kind of incoherent responses because um, she would be talking in a therapy session about like for instance um, her marriage uh, failing and tears would like well up in her eyes, um, but her face would be totally flat otherwise. And like therapists would say, hey, it looks like you're like crying. And she like, she like, yeah, you know, I don't have control of this. My eyes just do that sometimes. <laughs> like, <laughs> and uh, so point being, it's not inconsistent that this is the explanation in some cases. Um, and I mean, there is some actual developmental literature, you know, suggesting ways this could kind of happen too, right? So if you look at um, the, sort of drawing version of how people's body feels when they're feeling different emotions. Mm -hmm. um, Six-year-olds, like if you look at sadness, six-year-olds, it's pretty like nondescript, it's basically nothing, whereas in adults, it's really highly specific, mm -hmm. right? So you could imagine ways in which the six-year-old version just persists mm -hmm. um, under certain sorts of like unfortunate developmental circumstances or something like that, right? Um, so the next version, so just like all failure to infer, um, this this uh, corresponds to something we've talked about in the past called um, affective agnosia. Mm -hmm. um, the idea being something a lot like a visual agnosia where, uh, yeah. um, well, what just happened? Okay, right. So the basic idea is kind of just like a, with a, like an associative visual agnosia where you could have like a, an experience, perceptual experience like that shovel, right? A person could draw it for you and everything. But you ask them, what is it? And they have no idea, right? Or they misrecognize it as something else. Um, so I there's a similar sort of thing that could happen, but in the sort of emotional realm, affective agnosia, where a person perceives and could describe the bodily feeling, but just doesn't recognize what it means. Um, and, and often what will happen in this case is that it'll be misrecognized as something else. Um, and so in the somatization case, you might say, think you're feeling, you know, have a bodily sensation consistent with fear or panic, but instead infer, oh, this is a heart attack, mm -hmm. which often happens. People with panic attacks often run to the ER, right? right? Um, so, so one way to make sense of this, or potentially, right, would be if a person's just learned to have really strong prior expectations for, th for threatening somatic states. Mm -hmm. um, um, one interesting example of this is people with high anxiety sensitivity scores, um, like actually characterized as just that. Mm -hmm. um, and this is actually something in part that we've talked about in a, a recent paper where we were trying to kind of give explanations for um, why uh, early adversity is actually associated with higher levels of chronic pain. Um, I don't have time to get into it, but um, if you're interested. Um, and so here, I mean, it's interesting what actually happens if you give the thing higher prior expectations for sickness and heart attack, right, for this threatening somatic states, then what happens is basically the model just jumps to conclusions too quickly. 
Like all it does is pay attention to its arousal level, sees high arousal, and it's like, oh, I already know. You know, so it just says it's having a heart attack. It doesn't, it's too confident, right? So it doesn't pay attention to the context or anything else that would allow it to say, okay, now I'm probably just having some anxiety. Um, yes. So I'm not gonna finish it all if I don't take a power through here, but um, um, but we can talk at the end. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, Again, I should probably skip some of the empirical work here, just given time, but basically we have shown that if you look at people with different emotional awareness levels, the default mode network actually only activates more than somatic representation systems um, if you have high emotional awareness. So, so it looks like you don't really differentiate emotions from bodily sensations at the low end, um, which is kind of consistent with this idea. Um, so a third one so could be that you just, you just have an acquired emotion Right, so consider like a person who grows up in like an environment with a lot of like just early parental neglect. Mm -hmm. You don't have the attunement, you don't have the you know, social feedback signals to learn about these things, and so you just don't acquire them. Um, and um, this is probably also something that contributes a lot to, if you want to understand things like the relationship between social support and disease, we've talked about in the sort of computational variant of the uh, trying to understand the biopsychosocial model in medicine, and uh, we've talked about this a little bit there, but um, you, yeah, like if you don't have the early support, then you're not going to learn the things that you're, you're going to need to learn. Um, and that can lead to a bunch of things that can promote systemic disease later in life, um, the short version. Um, but so here, um, really, all you have to do to mimic not having acquired emotion concepts is just to get rid or flatten out the, you know, connections between the emotion concepts and what they predict, right? If those states don't predict anything specific, that's the same thing as saying you don't have those concepts. Um, and so if you do that, then, um, skip that, um, then what happens is unsurprisingly, um, the thing never really becomes very confident no matter what it experiences. At the end of the day, it's like, okay, I have to report something, so it just reports that it feels bad. Um, it's not confident, it knows it's feeling an emotion, but it's not confident enough to pick a specific one, and it doesn't want to be wrong, um, so it just says bad. Um, and, uh, and interestingly, this version predicts that you'd have much longer reaction times, right? So in the first version, if somebody has a low emotional awareness score, they have a really fast reaction time because they jump to conclusions really quickly, right? Whereas this person sits around forever and like, I don't know what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. So like you could actually test just based on reaction times, which one of these sorts of mechanisms was most plausible in a given individual. Um, I was just saying, I think that's a very important distinction and, and finding because you could also make the argument that a distinction between good and bad is just a very crude, mm. uh, low-level distinction that should be made very quickly. Right. So that reptiles can decide mm -hmm. if it's good or bad. Right. But this is saying, no, actually, it's really uh, related to some kind of ambivalence and ambiguity that, mm -hmm. that the, the individual's having trouble resolving. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, or it could be, at least in certain people. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it'd be, it'd be cool to be able to say, you have fast reaction times, you have slow reaction times, therefore I treat you with treatment A, treat you with treatment B. Right? That would be kind of the hope. Um, and um, again, you know, just briefly, I mean, we've done some um, work like with resting state functional connectivity, um, showing that, you know, if you think about functional connections as reflecting differentiated, say, like synaptic, you know, connection patterns that would correspond to learning, um, then what we found is in both the default network and in salience network, uh, body state representation uh, regions, you have much lower um, functional connectivity at rest than people with low emotional awareness. Um, so at least something about the fidelity of that kind of processing is, is, is not as uh, great. This is just some of the data and correlations, but, um, uh, but I should just mention, we have another paper that's under review right now where we actually simulate the emotion concept learning process itself. Um, with active inference, and that also is kind of a cool story about when learning can go wrong, um, but I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, so then a fourth possible mechanism is just having learned bias patterns of attention. Um, this is another thing that comes in a lot, actually, when thinking about chronic pain in the context of uh, chronic uh, negative affective states, um, but um, that we've talked about before. Um, but here, I mean, it's pretty simple. You just... You just use the E matrix thing, the prior prior over uh, policies, and you just say this person has a really strong habit of only paying attention to context, right, for an external attention bias, or this person has a really strong prior that they're going to attend only to the internal stuff, right? And I mean, kind of, you know, as it's set up, 
you have to integrate context information with the body state information to be good at inferring you know, what you're feeling um, or understanding it. Um, and so if you simulate these different sorts of attentional biases, you get low emotional awareness behavior, but they have different patterns. Um, you know, in one, if it's an external bias, if they're kind of like averse to paying attention to the other body altogether, right, then they just end up reporting, you know, bad or good. Um, whereas if they ignore context and just have this hyper focus on their body, then they just tend to kind of um, report kind of like an emotion thing or a body thing kind of half and half, mm -hmm. right? They're just kind of inconsistent. Um, a fifth one, again, I'm just kind of rushing through these quickly because we're short on time. Um, Something that's interesting in the context of borderline personality disorder is this idea about beliefs and emotional instability or high emotional volatility. Right? If you just believe that you could be sad in one moment and happy in the next, and right, if, if you don't think emotions have some minimal amount of stability, then it actually becomes really hard to learn about them or infer them if you have to selectively integrate information about them over time. Right? So in this case, you just flatten out the B matrix down here to say, look, like emotions are allowed to transition to other emotions or to somatic states within trial, um, then what you end up with something like this, where the thing's just not confident. At every moment, it just rechecks the same thing it looked at before, because it's something could have changed. And what you end up with is things like, it starts out believing that it was feeling panic, but by the end, it self-reports that it's feeling having a heart attack. You know, so it's like, I mean, it might have started out as just panic, but now, you know, now it's a heart attack. Uh, so it's another thing that's kind of interesting. Um, and then the, the last two mechanisms are when you have to invoke kind of this higher level, right, the working memory level. And here, I mean, again, just review papers on stuff if you're interested in more detail. But the idea is how do you kind of model this presence or absence of this strong connect, strong causal influence that actually updates the higher level. Um, and um, this is also motivated by some work we've done, um, some graph theoretic analyses that we've done showing that um, actually if you look at individual differences in emotional awareness, they actually correlate with lower network density and with uh, longer average path lengths. Mm -hmm. so, so those are just two measures of essentially long range information integration. So if you have higher emotional awareness, you're better at propagating the signals over long ranges, right? So kind of consistent with this general idea that this is a possible thing. Um, and here, it's a similar kind of trick. You just take these connections from the first level to the second level and any of them that involve updating based on emotional information at the first level, you flatten out. Um, which is essentially the same thing as saying the first level representations no longer have causal influence on the higher level. Right? Um, and if you do that, then what's really cool is you get something a lot like unconscious emotion priming. Right? So at the first level, it is representing sadness and then panic and then neutral. Right? That's there but just in kind of this prime state. It could have some kind of semantic priming effects, but it doesn't update the higher level at all, so the thing can't hold the emotions in mind, work with them at all, and it gets it wrong um, when it needs to report something or think about, explicitly think about what it's feeling. Um, and then the final one, um, one that's um, kind of interesting um, in clinical context with some of the clinical clinicians that I've worked with in the past, um, has to do with this idea about sort of state differences and reflective capacity. Um, the idea here is, is that, um, again, the image doesn't show up that well, but um, there's this really like well-known result that um, cognitive performance, like the ability to kind of reflect on things, cognitive control, working memory, all that stuff, um, tends to be best at this kind of middle level of arousal. If you're like really highly anxious, then all of a sudden you can't reflect on anything at all and, and um, decision making becomes a lot more impulsive and unreflective um, and typically not all that adaptive. Um, and one way to think about this is that in high arousal states, um, the predictability or the, the precision assigned to the higher levels of processing, like that reflect these sort of long time scale regularities, um, those just kind of get assigned low precision. Because mm -hmm. in, in threatening contexts, sort of historically, you act now or you're eaten, right? So it doesn't make sense to assign high, high uh, precision to those, to the high levels in those contexts. And so you can kind of think about this as in a state dependent way um, decreasing the transition precision um, at the higher level, which um, Thomas Parr and other people have, have previously already shown this is a way to mimic uh, lower working memory capacity as well as essentially the same kind of idea. So what happens in this case is 
um, even say if at time point two it knew that it was feeling, it was feeling uh, in this case, panic, um, then that just kind of decays away over time. So it can't actually, even though it knew it at one point in time, it can't hold it in mind and actually use it. Um, and uh, and um, so that's just yet another um, kind of mechanism. And again, I wish you could see it better on the image because it, it really does kind of just decay away until the probability distribution becomes flat by the end. Um, but, um, but so anyway, so I mean, the idea is just basically you can use this and you can show, look, there's at least these seven different independent mechanisms mm -hmm. that could be messed up um, or working um, suboptimally that could lead to the same or a very similar clinical phenotype, um, but they have different underlying causes and you would target them differently. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we've actually, in our, in our paper, we actually outlined, and you can't see it, but um, for each of the different mechanisms, there are different sort of clinical evaluations that are currently used, different relevant measures that are currently used to try to, that you could use to evaluate them, um, and different interventions that look like they target some more than others. And there are also gaps, right, where you can design things that would more effectively target one versus the other, but a lot of it is kind of out there somewhere. It's just not framed in this way or selected, you know, treatments are selected based on this kind of thing. Um, and so, the basic idea is, is that, like I said, there's a bunch of these different possible mechanisms. You could actually test them based either on different predicted neural response patterns or behavioral patterns like reaction time differences. Um, and you know, if that ends up working, right, you have to do experimental, do experimental work to actually test that. But in principle, you could use that to identify mechanisms that operate in single individuals and then use that for targeted intervention. Um, so um, with that, uh, tons of people to acknowledge, but um, top of the list would be yeah, Carl Friston, Thomas Parr, uh, Richard Lane, Maxwell, Jasper, um, Paul Badcock, uh, Scott Kilgore, and a bunch of other people. But, uh, thank you.